You know, as we crossed over on a watch tonight service here, we are here to not only just welcome the year, we are not just here to bless each another, but how many know that we were here to ask God to lead us? Because we must always understand, Pastor Linda mentioned about Israel was promised a land. But we were promised something even greater than just the land. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says that we were given that promise with Jesus that we can be blessed with all spiritual blessings in Christ. This is a tremendous promise because in this 7,480 promises contained in this very book of God, there is a covenant of the old, there is a covenant of the new. But there's a covenant for eternity, an eternity which God holds, an eternity that goes from glory to glory. Somebody shout amen to that. And we must understand that God has called us to be a people of power, the people of praise. And He paid the price. But every time we think of eternity, we've got to ask the question, what does eternity really mean for us? To most of us, we think Eternity is just about a time when we die and we go to heaven. A time when this place where there's so much pain, so much tears, so much sorrows, uncertainties and confusions will end. And then we'll be in the everlasting arms of our Lord and Saviour. In a place where there's no more tears, no more pain, no more sorrows. And there's an eternity of praise and worship. You know, but the thing is this. And we think we are headed towards eternity. But yet, we live our lives like that eternity is never coming. We build. We store. We make up. We live our lives that like it's no end. But yet, the Word of God tells us it accounts for men to die. No, no, once. And then there's a time of judgment. And we understand that there is the time of judgment, yet, yet we live our lives as if the time is never coming. But I want to tell you this. We are now in a new season. And the word that God has caused us to release, that word even at our prayer meeting, that word even at our leaders' meeting, and that word is actually from Isaiah 43, verse 18. A word that says, remember not. You know, this word remember is very interesting. We're called to remember certain things. We're called to re- not to remember certain things. I remember in the time when I was going through a lot of struggles in 1998, the Lord gave me this verse, Deuteronomy 8.18, and it starts with, remember the Lord thy God. And you know, there's something different in this word remember here and the word remember there. And the word remember there was a word that tells us that we are to remember not just by calling God to remembrance, just by not by calling Him to mind, which often we only do when we are facing problems. When we are facing a big problem, we always remember God. <laughs> but God's saying, no, constantly keep Him remembrance. But there's something He wants you to remember not. Because in order to move forward in the things of God, in order to understand this new season that God has given to us, He says, remember not. Didn't say remember not God, but remember not the former things. Not even the former things that are of glory. The former things of the great things that God has done for you. Remember not, He says. Not even what? Consider the things old. Don't keep looking back into yesterday. You see, the problem with yesterday is this. We can be caught up and constrained in yesterday. Why? But good memories. Yes, good memories sometimes make us do not want change. We want to just hold on to what we have. Sometimes the former things are of achievements and glories we have done. And we are so happy with just what we have done with our life. But how many know that our life is not just for the season here on earth? 
but it's for a season beyond this physical life. And that season, God says, you can't even cross into if you keep remembering the former things and if you keep looking at the things of old. The past glory, let it be in the past. Because I want you to hear this. God says, I'm bringing you from glory to glory. The past glory, the glory of the former house. I want to tell you this. That's a glory of the latter house. And the Word of God reminds us that the glory of the latter house is much greater than the glory of the former house. So why are we caught in the past? But today is a day of transition. The day when we are moving into a new season, new times. And that's what the Word reminds us. To behold, not to look at the past, to behold the past, but to behold, who are we to behold? God Himself. To behold God. And He says, I will do a new thing. And you know the Word of God is clear. Now it shall spring forth. It's not say, it will spring forth sometime in the future. How many of you know God is a God of now? God's a God right now is with you. He is right now, if you're a true believer, in you. And He's a God that will never leave you. And we must understand this eternity to eternity. But you know what God spoke to me as we cross over in 218? It was a season, He said. You know, God works in numbers. We call it biblical numerology, if you like. And every number has a significance. The first day had a significance. The second day had a significance. The number three even has a significance. Four. Five. Six. And seven always has significance of the perfection of God where there can be eternal rest. But you know, before there is a seventh day, there must be a sixth day. Before there's a sixth day, there must be a fifth day. But God is talking now, and He spoke to me as that season was changing. He says, I'm not talking about a chronos day. I'm not talking about a day which is just 24 hours. I'm not talking about a day of just 12 hours that you are awake and 12 hours where you should be asleep. But God says, I'm talking about a day which is my kairos. And the kairos of God, the Bible says, is not the kairos of man. We always think of the perfect timing of man. And when's the perfect timing of man? When we get what we want. But the perfect timing of God is about when God gets what He wants. And understand this, the word kairos itself. The Bible tells us you can't think of kairos of God in terms of chronos. The chronos tells us there is minutes, hours, which make up a day and the number of days that make up a week. Now, how many know the kairos of God to God the Apostle Peter says, one day is like a thousand years. A thousand years is like one day. You see, it's never measured and it's never limited. To God, the Kairos is when God says, now is the time and now is the season. Now is the moment. And God is saying, now, right now. And that word began to speak to me. God says, behold, look at me. Do you know you study the word, Behold is very interesting. So many times when the word behold is used, we understand that the word, the living word, Jesus, came into the dimension of time. Came in, stepped out of eternity into limitation of time, space, and matter. He became flesh for a reason, the Bible says, that we can behold the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. God wants us to behold. And here now, 
He's saying, don't look at the former things, but look at me. Behold! How many know that God's in season that right now? God has revealed himself and God will continue to reveal himself not only in a spiritual dimension, but in a natural dimension right now. And this is something as we look into what eight, we must begin to renew the way we think. We begin to have to let go of certain things. We have to be ready to look at He who brings us the hope and the future. And as we behold Him, the Word of God says, I will do a new thing, God says. And not only I will do a new thing, but He says, now, it is right now. You don't have to wait to eternity. Now it shall spring forth. Wow, you know, that word resonated with me. When for the first time the Lord spoke to me, why you keep thinking of yesterday and tomorrow? I am the God of the now. You know, faith is also of the now. Hope is something you can look forward to. Yes, God has a hope in the future. But God says the hope in the future begins with your now. What is your now focus on? Is your now focus on just a hope in the future? Or is your now focus on the God of now? You know, when this word began to come in, now it shall spring forth. And you know, he said, God knows about it. And he adds his word, shall you not know? Shall you not know? God already knows. He said, for I know. I know the plans I have for you. I know the plans is of good and not evil. I know the plans that God has for you. And I'm speaking to you individually, not just corporately for us as a church. Yes, this Friday, we'll do a bit of vision casting and we'll share with you those are coming. Make the effort to come so that we can understand where we are going as a corporate body here. Amen. Amen. But understand that when God talks about this, He's talking even right now for you, individually, personally, that these plans He has for you is to what? Build you up. It's never to tear you down. It is to give you hope. It's to give you future. But I want you to hear this as God has a plan. There's somebody called S.A. Tan who also has a plan. I'm not talking about a Chinese person. <laughs> but he has a plan. And I want you to hear this. His plans are never good. His plans are always to bring you to the evil end. His plans seem like counterfeit plans. Want to give you hope, desires. But I want to tell you this. And I've said this to many people who discuss this. I have backslided a time when I was sitting in temple committees when I was worshipping the devil without realising it. Yes. And in that time, I did not understand a lot of things. But yet we did understand something. That the evil one can give you false blessings. But we as Chinese always say, but to ai hui zo teng. There's a time of payment back. You know, we understood that, and yet we did not understand what we worship. I was worshiping something, but today I worship another thing. I worship God who says, I'm a God that created, I'm a God that loves you, I'm a God that even prepared to pay the price to die for you. His plans is His covenant, His covenant is His agreement. His agreement is what He's trying to reveal to us even right now. You know, this Bible is a tremendous Bible. It contains nuggets of truth. It contains matters of science. Do you know that? There's so many scientific facts recorded in this Bible that man in his wisdom did not even know it then. Even as was recorded, God sits upon the circle of the earth that begin to spark. Christopher Columbus to think about if God sits on circle of the earth, then the earth must be round. And that was written years before Columbus became a believer and was born. 
In Columbus' time, the people thought that the world was flat. If you sail out too far from the land, you fall off the face of the earth. Today, of course, we laugh at that notion. But in that limited understanding, people thought the world was flat. But yet, before people could even understand what God had created, God says, my spirit sits upon the circle of the earth. You see, God is about a circle which is in a never broken eternal ring. God is about eternity to eternity and He never changes. You know, that's one thing about the Word of God that reminds us. We call it in theological studies the immutability of God. Immutability means about the consistency of God. He's so consistent. In that consistency, there's the unchangeability of God. God changes not. In the consistency and unchangeability, God knows from eternity to eternity. And he says, my plans of hope in the future. I want to tell you this. The devil can seem to offer hope in the future. But I want you to hear this. The hope he offers is never lasting. And if you are worshipping the wrong God, you'll find your life reaches a point where there's helplessness, when there's hopelessness, when people can get depressed because they see no future. But I want to tell you this. God says, I am the future. And the Word of God says, 1 John 2.20, that you can have an unction from Him. You know the word unction? People call it the, what, anointing. It's more than that. God says, you can have that manifested presence of me in your life. Jesus wants to be in your life. He says, I do not just call you as a servant. I call you as a friend. A master will not reveal everything to his servant. But will not a friend reveal all things to a friend? And he says in that word, there can be that manifested unction from God where you can also know all things. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. And as we cross the 2018, I want to tell you this. God wants you to know all things that's going to happen. Amen. And the first thing I want to tell you this. If you have been waiting for the day you die to go into eternity, I want to tell you, God is not waiting for you to come into eternity. He is working right now today to bring eternity into reality. The eternity that God has for you and I, as I use the word, true believers of Jesus Christ, is not the hope of eternity to come. There is a kingdom to come. But there is eternity here and now. And you can live kingdom dynamics Kingdom glory, kingdom power, here and now. And behold, what are you beholding? Are you looking at the circumstances, situations? Are you looking to natural eyes? Hearing to ears that will be hearing all the circumstances and situation. Terrorism is going to increase. That's part of prophecy. Lawlessness will be here. Somebody sent me an article. Another country has just passed the same sex law. My reply was, it's an uncle of mine. I said, thanks dear uncle. But should we be surprised? Jesus said, lawlessness will come. And lawlessness is not just about civil disorder. Lawlessness is not just about terrorism and unrest. Lawlessness is also when civil governments legislate against the very laws of God. And I want to tell you this, we are in that season right now. God is working, increasing, accelerating, moving the momentum. But let me tell you this, somebody has been around longer than you and I. History of men, <laughs> they say it's about coming to 6,000 years. And in that 6,000 years from creation, 
that man called S. A. Tan also existed. And he knows. He's smarter than a lot of us. You know, it's true. The Bible reveals how Satan got a strategy. What is strategy? His modus operandi is to bring you into the lust of your flesh, the lust of your eyes, and the pride of your life. This strategy has been using for thousands of years. And it's still working for him. But God keeps reminding us that these things are not of the Father. The last of the eyes, the last of the flesh, and the pride of life, Scripture says. But they're here in the world. And Satan knows that he, if he can make you keep your eyes upon these things, keep your flesh inclined, keep the objective of your life onto these things. What did God say in the Garden of Eden? There's life. There's death. And he says, there's choice. God doesn't want you to go to hell and eternal death. But he says, you choose. He left the choices, life or death. Eternity can be eternity in hell or eternity in heaven. You choose. Where do you make your choices? Right here now in this life. Before it comes for men to die but once and then judgment. I'm taking a long time laying this because we need to understand right now the season we are in. You see, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 4 to 6 reminds us something. And it's a question that God asks. After talking about the spiritual and the natural, the Apostle Paul says, How be it? How is it? Since the natural dimension is so important. Since faith, we understand by faith that even the creation of the world, that the world was formed by the things that were not seen. But I said, how be it? It's not the spiritual that comes first. It's yet the natural. How be it? But I want to tell you this. That is a revelation for people who are fallen. In the fallen state, we always have the natural that will come before even the spiritual. In the natural state, our eyes will begin to see circumstances, situations, opportunities, ambitions and plans. I want to tell you this. In the ambitions and plans, we shake our fists at God if we don't get what we want. But I want to tell you this. I'm glad that God doesn't shake his fists better than us. Because he's a God that loves. And we can't understand even love. Because in our human nature, our love is of the flesh. Our love is what is called what? There is an agape and there's a filial. In the filial, there's also other love, eros and all the rest. But filial is about our human love. What's our human love? A young man says to a woman, I love you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. <laughs> Some, after one year, will say, I've lost my love for you. <laughs> Some may be longer. <laughs> but I want to tell you this. I did not understand agape. I struggled with the word agape for a long time. I know. We define agape love of God as unconditional love. That God loves you irrespective and God loves you without condition. God loves you for who you are. But we don't understand the source of agape itself. The source of agape is God. It is about His whole nature and character of God. You know, I didn't understand this until I was, we were actually hosting a conference. And I was sitting there listening to, to the invited speaker that we had invited. And all of a sudden, yeah, Rob Hodge came. And he said these words, God did not love you by 
choice. He loves you because of his nature and character. You know the Bible says this? God is love. That's nature and character. And that was the first time that this revelation of God's love hit me. And this word came right down my heart. God is love. And God cannot not love you because He is love. Wow. Because He loves you, not by choice. But He loves you because He is love. But don't, don't get carried away that God is love and we can do what we want. You see, there is a multifaceted thing about God. That although God is love, God is also righteousness. In righteousness, God must judge. But God is also mercy. In mercy, there is forgiveness. But God is also grace. As He forgives, there's always God's grace to restore. Amen. That's the consistency of God. He wants to restore you back to His original plans. He wants to restore you back to what He intended. He wants to restore you back to the former things. That's why He says, and behold, although it's a new thing, I will make a way in the wilderness. Rivers in the desert. Do you know, this was to remind Israel something. Who was there in the wilderness with Israel? God. He led them in the wilderness. He provided them in the wilderness. Not just water. Everything, clothes did not decay, shoes did not fall off. When he needed food, there was manna in the day. <laughs> when they found God, fed up manna, he gave them quails in the evenings. Remember? And God was trying to show them, when I'm with you, you always have enough. Somebody said, I want amen only. <laughs> let, me, let me say this to you. When God is with you, you always will have enough. Amen. But God's plan for you is never to stay in enough. Amen. God wants to bring, Pastor Linda alluded to it, across the river into the land of good things. But in a good land of good things, there's things you have to begin to do. There's battles you have to fight. There's victories you've got to establish. There's taking back what is yours. And God wants to bring you into a land not just of enough, but a land of more than enough. A land of overflowing glory. A land that's full of milk and honey. A land where there's no more stress and worry. And you would think, that's when I go to eternity. No more tears, no more pain, no more sorrows. I want to tell you, God is with the death of Jesus Christ, with the coming of the new covenant. He's brought that reality of eternity to come into reality right now. Amen. Amen. And I want to tell you this. Is this possible? I have lived it. I used to be a businessman. I used to be a lawyer. I used to be rich, you know. But God had to bring me to lose everything to realize. Since 1998, he says, without faith, you cannot please me. But he that comes to faith must know, really, I am. And that I am a rewarder of those that diligently seek me. The Word of God reminds us, seek Him when He can still be found. <laughs> Amen. Today I'm laying these foundations. Because as I look at Expectations 218, it is very important. Why? This considered verse is about your attitudes. How do you know a lot of people, we say to people, you got an attitude. That's not good, right? When you say a fellow, you got an attitude, it's negative, right? <laughs> but yet, it's about the positive attitudes that bring you into the positive things of God. 
Amen. Let me, let me say this very clearly. Do you know positive thinking and all is all very biblical? But you say, no, no, that's what the world teaches, positive thinking and all. I want to tell you, you look at the principles. Some of those who taught that were actually Christians. Yes, I'm talking about Christian pastors that went into management consulting, so to speak. And they took the very principles of the Bible and they put it into secular words. And they found that to reach a secular world to make money, they had to take the spiritual dimension out. So you see, positive thinking is about what? When your thoughts are not our thoughts, His thoughts. The centrality is to remember Him in all things. But I show what positive thinking do. I went through all that young men. Napoleon Hill, think and grow rich. If you think you can, you can. If you think you can't, you can't. What's the centrality of it? You see, this is the center word in sin. I. And I comes me. And with me comes my. With my comes gimme, gimme, gimme. I mean, it's true, right? And I tell you this. Unfortunately, these very things have crept into the world. And it's crept into the church. Amen. That's why the Lord spoke to me about this need to cast this vision, to share some things that are needful to do and some things that are needful to get rid of. Because we can't move in the new thing if we are dressed in the old nature, the old character, the old mindset, the old carnality. And what happens? Old wineskins that cannot take new wine. God is the God of new wine. Amen. Amen. And God wants to bring you into this new wine. And I want to tell you this. I'm taking this time because that may be all I'm going to share in the sermon. There are a lot of things I want to share which I've not gone past page one yet. God says, I want you to stay there because until people can see the revelation of this, whatever you're going to share will not be received. You see, every year I have a prophetic word. And you know a lot of people come. Do you know at our wash night service, wow, we always get overflowing numbers. And you know what people are coming for? What's happening next year? Not that they can align their life. What's happening next year so that I can know how to invest my money and all. <laughs> I'm serious. Oh, God has showed us over different years. Well, even over the New Year's Eve, there was a word that even about the stock market there, Ah, that's one way to attract you to go and look at the Word. <laughs> but unfortunately, that's not what God wants you. God wants you to have eternity now. But yet, eternity now is about preparing you for an eternity to come. Amen. When Jesus is going to come back. Yes. When Jesus will sit on the throne. Yes. You know, that only happens on the seventh day when He enters. Mm-hmm. The seventh day is about the millennium that's promised, of 1,000 years where the kingdom of heaven will be on earth, when Jesus will sit on the throne and rule with a rod of iron. But you know the seventh day also has an end. (coughs) Yes, the Bible says. There is alludes to an eighth day when there's a period of rebellion will happen again after the 1,000 years of millennium rule. When Satan will be loosed. But as the ninth, seventh day, there's also the final completion of God. Nine is all symbolic of the completion. I couldn't understand it. God said that attempt by the devil to bring the eighth day, to pervert the seventh day, will not last. Because the eighth day will set the foundation for the ninth day, when I will then restore the total new heaven and earth. And do you know that last year, I said this in a prophetic word, the stage was set for the sixth day already. Because the sixth day must come before the seventh day. And the fifth day, yes, certain foundation, 217 of the fifth day, end of the fifth day. 
Do you know what was said there? First in September, go and listen to what I'm not going to preach all over again. God says there's going to be a spiritual shift. And there was. September the 9th, September 23rd, there was a spiritual shift. In that spiritual shift, some things will happen. What? That which was sealed in the days of Daniel chapter 12, verse 4. When Daniel was going to write down what he saw, he was told, no, seal up the book to the time of the end. How do you know the time of the end? When people run to and fro and knowledge will increase. We're in a season right now. I want to give you another thing. That which was sealed too was Revelations chapter 10, verse 1 to 10. When the apostle John saw the huge angel with a book, thunderous voices begin to reveal to him. As he started right, no, don't put it down. But he was given the book and told to eat the book. And you know when he ate it? He was bitter. Pure God, as we enter the final generation, there's a lot of bitter things that's going to happen. Many bitter things. I'm not saying 218 is the end. But many things is going to happen. How do we respond? You see, this is the important key. First response, like in discipleship, is about having the right attitudes. That's why we taught at the beginning of last year about the discipleship model starting with the Beatitudes. If you don't have the right attitudes, you won't be able to enter into the right things. Somebody say amen. amen. And we need to understand that this is very important. And this attitude is a problem. Because we've got to take our eyes off the things of the natural. That's why First Corinthians, I quoted, we tell us what comes with the things of natural, but the things of spiritual will come. But you've got to take your eyes off the natural to put your eyes onto the eternal, the spiritual, and then you have the fulfillment that God has. Yeah. Amen. And that's why this year, God said, was so critical. Every year, the time I spent and he gave a vision. You know, you all heard about it. Different vision I saw. Uh, it was even four-dimensional. Not only, not only actual movement, sounds, smells, everything I saw. It's like four-dimensional or whatever you want, five, fifth dimension, whatever. But this year, God was so quiet. And the Lord spoke to me. Why you keep seeking me? I have already revealed that over the course of whole of 2107 because 2017 was going to establish 218. You don't have to look to me for anything new. Review 2017. As you review 217, review 2016. Then it didn't end there. Go back to 2013. Because what? Five waves he showed me 2013. And he said the five ways only ends in 2018, right now. That new season begins. And I tell you this, this is the part of the timeline of God. 217 not only established that, 217 also established foundations for the eighth and the final. Do you remember? Events were there. One of the most important events... From 2015 already, the Lord told us two events to watch. In Europe, the collapse of the European Union. We first told me that Britain will exit. But more than that, the Lord says, understand, Europe has got very strong plans in God's end time plans. Because the Antichrist will be the one world leader that will come up from the ten nations of the old Roman Empire. Europe was a major part of the Roman Empire. Germany plays a very important key. The seed of Satan was moved to Germany. Then it was taken to Russia. But when Germany was free, that seed of Satan was returned. No, no, this fact. 
I won't tell you this. Watch Germany. The European Union will feature as much in God's plan. There is going to be an economic downturn like never before. And war will not even solve it. I've said this before. And it's going to happen. Watch Germany. God has revealed something to be a journey. I'm not even sharing in the open because <clears throat> God says there are some people you can share with. Some people you can't. I said, why not God? They say people without a wrong attitude will only receive the word in the wrong way. And they will not respond correctly. But they will respond in carnal, fleshy ways. Amen. How many know that in this new generation we cross into, God is returning the spiritual dimension. I want to say this again, God is returning the spiritual dimension. And we need to know this, there's a timeline of God in what God was doing in creation. There's a timeline of God that saw the fall. There's a timeline of God for redemption. And there's a timeline of God for restoration. We are in a timeline now for restoration. In the fifth day, in Genesis, what did he do then on the sixth day? How many remember? Amen. The pinnacle of God's creation, the apple is eye was created on the sixth day. Genesis 1.26, let us make men in our image and after our likeness. <clears throat> and let them have dominion. Okay, I already taught on this, the two words, uh, image and likeness. I'm not going to teach you again. And then after having done that, what do you do? <clears throat> Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 told us how he created. Not only with dust, to remind us, likeness is to like God, but yet we're not God. He neither slumbers nor sleep, but we are dust. But we cannot rule except if we be like God. Then what did he say? To make sure he breathed his life. It's not just Holy Spirit alone, not yet given. Because there was a testing to come. In that testing, we need to understand something. Genesis 2.8 begins to talk. He planted a garden east of Eden and he put men in the garden. If we don't understand that simple sentence, <clears throat> you will never understand the Christian victory. That's why when <clears throat> I teach this as course in our school of ministry, not too late, if you have not signed up, you want to sign up, we start classes this Wednesday. <clears throat> I'm serious. And the first class will be on Christian victory to understand what we're made to be, and who we are now in Christ. Then in 15, he says, and he put men again in the garden to dress and to keep. Now, I'm not going to do the whole teaching again. But the third thing he did was this. He then commanded men. You see, the garden had one final test. It's a test of obedience. And God is always saying, you choose. You choose life or you choose death. You choose my way or you choose the devil's way. If you keep staying in the world, looking at the things of the world, you will never choose the way of God. Yet, I won't tell you this. This is a lesson to learn. We are so caught up with living. We're so caught up with making money. We're caught, so caught, caught up with achieving. We're so caught up with trying to make ends meet. We are caught up in using the devil's way. We get into debt and we keep getting in debt and we have not learned a lesson because from 208, the Lord has been telling us to release His word year after year. Mount up the highway of holiness. Get out of debt because the spirit of mammon is working very strong today in a Babylonian system. And the spirit of debt is working that fuels the whole global economic system. And God said, in the final day, I'll bring the whole system down. And those who are, but he said, I, I believe in God. 
but does your faith and your action show what you believe in? Are you still caught up? There are still Christians, like I was, in debt, trying to borrow to get out of debt. I want to tell you, you cannot borrow to get out of debt. The more you borrow, the deeper in debt you get. I've already over the years been telling. Turn your eyes to God. And God said, as you commit your ways to me, as you submit to me, God says, I will get you out of debt. I stand as a living testament. In 1998, I was facing millions of dollars of guarantees I paid. But when I learn how to surrender to God and say, God, I agree, God, no more debt, no more borrowing, no more nothing, no more my ways. God, I'm to turn to you. I started to fast, I started to pray because I need to hear from God. Guess what? And that's when the breakthrough began. Some of you heard by 205, we were debt free. I, I don't, did no more business. We were staying in a condo, debt free. I was driving a new car, debt free. I want to tell you this, Christians. If God wants you to have something, as a good father, he will provide for you. Amen. You don't need to help him by getting into debt. That's right. If he wants you to have a new car, I want to tell you this. From 205, God has blessed me. And I'm not saying bless me for the sake of blessing him. Bless me because I learned to turn and learn to hear him. No more boring. No more boring. God provided. And God's ways are not our ways. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. They are higher. They are bringing us hope in the future and the hope in the future there is the spirit of liberty and the spirit of liberty there is freedom and deliverance. Amen. You know what's a new thing God told me this year crossing over? The old ways are finished. Gone. Old methods are finished. Gone. Even the curses of the past. He brought this as part of the word to me. No more will the children, teeth be on edge to taste the sour grapes of the father. I want you to hear this. He said, I've done everything that every generation of sin has been brought under the blood. But are you under the blood first? That's the key. It's not about going through a method. He says, it is about the spiritual dimension of believing what I have done in this time and this season right now. And I've raised you to be a people of power and people of praise, but not a spiritual man. I've raised you in this time to understand the, time of the, the signs of times. And the signs of time, he said, is that I'm preparing for a people that's ready for the return of Jesus Christ. Amen. And you know that 2017 that was said, I've said this again, December the 6th, was a very important date. It's a monumental, I've used the word. It's historical. And it is prophetic. Monumental because never in the history of modern Israel has open acknowledgement been given by a major world power. In 1995, US Congress passed the law to recognize this. But no US president since there had the guts to do the, any recognition. 6 December, you may call him a madman, you may call him whatever it is, but it's God's instrument to recognize it and to declare it. 1995 to then, December, is exactly 22 years. You know what the Lord spoke to me about this? It's a look at the book of Revelation. There are 22 chapters there. He said it took me 22 years to bring man into the final chapter of the book. Think of it. We are in the final chapter now. There's no more time of your own ways, your own thoughts, your own way of doing things. I want to tell you, <clears throat> mammon is going to be shaken. Everything that has to be shaken will be shaken. Judgment of nations is coming. I've talked about it, the goats and the sheep. Judgment of the church is also coming. Warning given. And judgment must begin in the house of God. 
There's going to be a separation of sheep and goat. Churches as well. But even the church, there is a separation of sheep and goats within the church. You notice, there are goats there. But they're not instruments of the devil yet. You know there's different goats and sheep? That, I was just sharing this yesterday. One thing about sheep is sheep very obedient. But sheep needs a shepherd. Sheep only eat grass and things like that. A goat is different. A goat very independent, wants to do things himself. He always go up, want to do his own thing. Goat is very individualistic. And goat fights the battle himself. That's why he got horns. Sheep cannot fight the battle by himself. That's why sheep always flock together because in the numbers, then they can have protection. And they need a shepherd to lead and to guide. And that's why Jesus said it, repeating from Zechariah, you smite the shepherd, you scatter the sheep. When the sheep is scattered, gone. So there are certain things we need to do. For us, understand this, the time will come now of the separation of the weeds and the tares. How many know there are instruments of the devil even inside the church? Yes. They are not goats. They are here to disrupt. Yes. They are here wolves in sheep clothing. They will look like Christians. They behave like Christians. They talk like Christians. But watch their fruit. Their fruit will come to divide. Their fruit will not come to build up. They seem to be building up for the kingdom. They are in the kingdom, the church. But you know, they are there as agents of the devil. What are they doing? They will sow discord. They will begin to sow subtle things, build up walls of division. Because why? The Lord says, and let them have dominion. God talks about unity, oneness. Remember Psalm 133? In the unity, God commands the blessing. It's not about you working for the blessing. It's not about you having to work for the blessing or anything. It's God who commands it. So I want to close this right now. There are many things I want to say, but I'll say this going forward, but we need to align. On Friday, I'll be sharing more of what we need to do as alignment. The church is meant also to be a Goshen. But a church is not just meant to be a Goshen. The church is called to be a warring church. Because God has raised up a warring believer. Amen. 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 Yes. Because they were trained in the wilderness to fight the battles, although God fought for them. Remember, <laughs> Moses yes. had to hold it up. Yes. But when they crossed the river, they had to take Jericho. Yes. They had to take Ai. Yes. There were battles to be fought. But God did not fight with them, but God fought for them. God gave the battle plan. And that battle plan was not about physical fighting. It's about bringing spiritual dimensions. And when God is with you, who can come against you? Is God with you? I'm asking. Are you aligned to what God is doing? Or are you thinking you are in God's plan, but yet doing the things the devil wants you to do? Time to wake up, church. We are now in that final chapter. We are now in that final chapter. You know what Jesus said in the final chapter? Matthew 23, 37, 39. He said this to, Israel, to Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto you. How often would I, Jesus talking, as a Messiah, gathered you, gathered your children together, even like a mother hen, gathered her cheeks under her wings. But you would not, you would not what? You would not let me. So he says, behold. <laughs> this behold is no good behold. <laughs> he says, your house is less desolate. You see, there's a consequences where we don't turn our eye upon Jesus as the author and finisher of our faith. If we don't commit our life to say, God, only in you alone, in your ways, in your things, can I live, can I move and have my being. 
I know there are a lot of people telling me, but pastor, there's reality. There's a reality of the world. And there's a reality of God. Somebody say amen to that. And we must understand, your house is left desolate. Then he gives the prophetic word. For I say unto you, you shall not see me. Henceforth, from this moment of the desolation, you will not see me. Till you shall say, Baruch Haba Veshelem Adonai. Betshem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus is coming back and soon. Let's start to re-look at our lives. Let's begin to repent. Let's begin to repent of our old ways. Let's not consider the former things. Let's not consider the old ways. So, yeah, people, God did it this way, God must do it this way now. No. Yet, God says, if you don't work, you don't eat. But God is not asking you to work until no day, no night. The garden is about God showing you gainful and purposeful work for God. Notice, huh? Gainful and purposeful work for God. In that gainful and purposeful work, God works for you. Amen. Let's quiet our hearts. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the foundations that's laid today. I thank you, this church that you are raising up right now. Men and women. Men and women that understand their destiny. Men and women that understand the ways of your soul. Men and women that rise up to the place of significance. Men and women that will be people of influence for you. God, your word not only requires fruitfulness of our life, You demand fruitfulness. But I thank you, God, it's you who commands that fruitfulness. Amen, I like that. God not only demands, He commands. So, Father, I thank you. Let those that hear, let them hear. Let them rise up to be overcomers for you in this season. And I'm going to invite you to altar is open. You need to do business with God, not with me. You need to ask God to show you what are the former things, what are the things that you'll be hanging on to. How you need and what you need to do, the mindful. What is needful that you can truly be that man or the woman of God that God wants you to be in this time and this season. Time is running out. Time is getting short. And Father, I give you glory. Holy Spirit, come. Come, Lord, to convict us of the sin that separates us from you. Come, Lord, give us the spirit of wisdom in the very revelation of you that we know how we need to pattern ourselves after you. Is it not what you said that you have a destiny for each and every one of us that we be conformed to the very image of Christ? Do we conform to the very image of Christ? It's about walking as He walks, thinking as He thinks, and doing as He would do. Father, I release this anointing even right now. I release a sense of urgency even right now. I bind the spirit of stupor that wants to keep people asleep from the things of God. Wake them up in this season, this time. Let the anointing fall the dimension, Father. They'll break every yoke. They'll break off every yoke, I say, Lord. And take the broken pieces off their shoulders. Let them walk in the liberty and be yoked with you and you alone, Lord. Release the anointing for that, God. And I give you thanks. We want to be there in that final day to come back with you. To be able to even proclaim with Israel, blessed be the name, the one who comes 
in the name of the Lord. And we give you glory. 